and welcome back. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree that it's a wonderful start to ASPE's first land conference. Now you would have noticed, uh, for those who have opened up this morning, uh, the conference program is divided up into uh, five sessions over the two days. Now while each of the sessions will stand alone, um, they will build over the two days to provide what we believe will be a, a unique view of Army and the policy issues, which will shape its four structure options over the coming decade or so. Given the high expectations of the coming white paper and the capability plan, we hope the conference will also offer a, offer a lens through which to examine the efficacy of the government's policies, both for defence and the Army. Now, the program also shows the, the bios for each of our speakers. Generally, we do not intend to retell the speakers' impressive histories. What I will do is, at the beginning of each of the sessions, provide a context for what we were hoping to get out of the session uh, and before the speakers start. With the exception of this next session, we have scheduled an open forum discussion at the end of each session. And this, if you could hold your questions to the end, and that'll be the opportunity to unpack any of the issues the, the speakers have covered. To turn now to session two. In this next session, we're seeking to set the strategic con context for the rest of the conference. Our first speaker, Dr. John Blaxland from ANU, and we've asked John to review Army's intellectual and reform journey over the last decade and a half or so. Drawing any lessons, or identifying any shortcomings since the start of the last decade. Now, John has most recently authored a book titled The Australian Army from Whitlam to Howard, which provides an interesting backdrop to his comments today. John will be followed by the Deputy Chief of Army, Major General Rick Burr, who will discuss Army's approach to international engagement. And given the comments in the first session this morning, international engagement will be no doubt a challenging balancing act on the part of the Army. Rick has most recently returned to Australia from Hawaii, where he was Deputy Commanding General of the US Army Pacific. Rick will be followed by his previous boss, General Vince Brooks, Commanding General US Army Pacific, to provide an ally's perspective of the challenges facing armies generally. Given the uh, global and regional pressures that continue to challenge governments and how they might potentially shape armies thinking. Given this background, uh, the Head of uh, Modernisation and Strategic Planning Army, Major General Gus McLaughlin, will discuss how Army is considering responding to these and other challenges. We will then change gear a little and we'll be joined by the Honourable Ian McFarlane, the Minister for Industry and Science. While, we'll get in, while we will get into some more detail in industry policy tomorrow, uh, we felt it was important to frame the discussion a little particularly given the expectations of the new defence industry policy, which will be announced by the government later this year. This session will then be drawn to a close by the Prime Minister. I welcome Dr John Blaxland and ask him to kick off the session. Thanks very much. Um, it's a great honour to be here and uh, it's a difficult act to follow the uh, Chief of Army. Uh, I've been asked to talk about reform so far and I wanted to frame that in terms of government expectation, the determinants for government expectations. And I would argue that they are proximity or necessity, alliance management and risk tolerance. Um, and the closer to shore we get, the greater the likely force contribution we can be expected to make, the, the greater the risk casualty tolerance the government will tolerate, the greater the neighbourhood consequences if we stuff it up, the greater the importance of intellectual investment in getting it right because the long-term consequences can't be towed away, can't be forgotten because it's in a different continent. The, and also the greater the significance of cultural language and historical understanding to get it right with the nuance right because it's not just about kinetic effects as we all know. And the greater the allied expectation of Australian primacy, much like we saw with Interfet in 1999. And the further away, of course, the lesser that is the case. Now, we, I just want to go back a bit before 1999, a little bit, to put a bit of context on this. This was a very benign period of the 1970s and 1980s after the Vietnam War, when we saw uh, uh, arguably what I would see as a breather for reinvestment. Now, in, in this audience, I know a lot of critics of Paul Dibb, but I want to point out to you there's some real benefits to what happened under the DOA construct. construct. We got bare bases, we got Norcom, we got army presence in the north, we got RFSUs, we got three brigades. Now, you might laugh at that, 
but the alternative in the 1950s, up until Pentropic, was three battalions, only two of them which were operationally effective. One was a training battalion. So we need to think about how low the bar can be set if you let it. That construct, as much as we thought the idea of nongs and thongs was ridiculous, it actually gave us the construct to legitimise three brigades. And that is to his credit. As much as I've been a critic of him in the past, the bottom line is he, in effect, did us a, did us a favour. Um, and also, sorry, if you just think about that for a moment, we had about 12 to 14 divisions in the Second World War. We have a lot less to play with now, um, and we could have gone a lot further down the pile. Um, of course, that then, the whole DOA construct was rocked by the experience of Operation Morris Dance uh, when uh, City of Anirambuka uh, 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 arrested uh, 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 Timothy Bavandra, Bob Hawke, the Prime Minister, called in Kim Beasley and the Acting Foreign Minister, Gareth Evans, said, we've got to do something, we've got to, got to rescue Timothy Bavandra. And, of course, PC Gration, the voice of sanity, comes in and says, you are joking, right? We can't do that. We don't have the capability. Um, and that, of course, it should have been a, a triggering point uh, for a sober reflection on the lack of amphibious reach. It wasn't, and there were reasons for that, because it, it, the, the, the plan that was put forward by General Gration and the commanders at the time met the adjusted government requirements, and they gave up on that idea of rescuing T Timothy Bavandra and changed their mind. Um, there were no expectations to adjust the force structure as a consequence of that, and there was little impact on strategic priorities as a consequence of that. DOA stayed to the case for quite some time. So uh, in the post-Cold War period, after 89, we see a whole series of operations of choice emerge. Namibia, Somalia, Rwanda, Cambodia, Western Sahara. We go to a whole range of places and we get this moniker of being ambassador, soldier, teacher, peacekeeper. It's quite flattering. It's quite good for the ego. A lot of people feel good about it, but it actually has very little consequence in terms of force structure, in terms of strategic decisions about what we're doing and, and, and little impact on strategic priorities at all during this period. And of course, during this period, we've got a number of chiefs of army who are struggling with the force structure review. The 1993 was basically, you know, taking stuff from teeth to tail, they say, but in effect, it was stripping the army. What does the chief of army do? He focuses on eth ethos and values, as General Gray did. General Sanderson, he did some conceptual work with the Land Warfare Development Centre and the establishment of the Land Warfare Study Centre. And of course, organisationally, he started going down this path, this dark path, in hindsight, of Army 21, or the restructuring of the army. That, that was designed to meet DOA stipulations, but it, in fact it was a conceptual dead end. It was a situated appreciation that didn't help us out in the long run. But un it was understandable in the context of the time that was overtaken by the events of the ASP, Australian Strategic Policy 1997, the Defence White Paper of the time, which redrew the boundaries. It ended, it ended the Defence of Australia as the primary force determinant. Uh, and General Hickling catches on on that, and he then comes up, he coins this concept-led capability-based army. He embraces the con maritime concept of strategy, which his predecessors were constrained not to do because of DOA. Uh, and he generates the Directorate General of Future Land Warfare, the Centres for Army Lessons and the Combat Training Centre, and he initiates uh, the, the publication of a new fundamentals of land warfare. We owe a lot to General Hickling for what he did. Of course, in the meantime, ops of less choice are coming, uh, are coming up as well. These are operations where they're in our neighbourhood and there really is an op obligation on Australia to do something. That's in Bougainville, in PNG, in the Irinjaya with drought relief, uh, with tsunami relief. And here we see niche force contributions participating and humanitarian assistance and political objectives being very happily met. So we're, we're meeting the government's expectations. We help bolster regional security. We're dealing with big issues like the problem in Bougainville. Uh, and we're also, incidentally, honing the force. Uh, and this is actually crucial preparation for what's just about to happen, of course, in East Timor. Because this was, as Hugh White says, a strategic blunder. There was no intention on the government's part for this to happen. There was a letter sent to Habibi offering uh, some kind of Matignon Accord deal, where you have sort of a, 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 an arrangement where East Timor could, could go through a, a period of consultation. Of course, Habibi said, no, 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 we're going to have an election straight away. Because, ooh, geez, OK. Um, so we then go and... It turns ugly. Uh, the US alliance is called on. And, uh, of course, the Americans don't want to play because they're too busy in Kosovo. And they really think we can deal with it. And they're kind of right, you know. Uh, we can. Except we need a little bit of supplementation with uh, comms, 
with logistics, with a bit of intel and transport support, especially to get the contingents to come in because we're maxed out trying to get ours in. Um, this, this is a remarkable tactical success that led to uh, extraordinary reinvigoration of the ADF. It really was the tipping point, if you like, uh, for reform in, 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 the, in the Army and the ADF. And it demonstrated the importance of jointry and collaboration, the utility of the ABCA ties, all of the ABCA partners play, Canada, New Zealand, the Brits, the Americans, to a, with a small contingent, all there. It's, it's remarkable. Um, and we see logistic and other shortfalls emerge, and we see the significance of regional ties emerging as well. And of course, as John Howard said, one of the more noble things Australia has done in many years. Then of course we get caught up in operations of choice far away in the Middle East area of operations. Uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, we see networked operations, we see niche roles contributing in Iraq and then in <coughs> Afghanistan, then again in Iraq and then again in Afghanistan. Uh, but we're not seeing a force, com a combined force like we saw in the Vietnam War. We've, said, we've sent the, the, the first Australian task force, a brigade sized combined arms, all arms team to go and do a province thoroughly. And there's little of myths and legends due to tight media constraints during this period. Um, and I would argue that we, uh, the ADF was learning some wrong, uh, incomplete lessons from this experience because of the niche nature of the contribution. In the meantime, we're seeing interagency regional border operations uh, 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 sprout, if you like, and we're seeing the, the Army having to work much more closely with the Navy and the Air Force and the police and the customs and the... Uh, various uh, aid and other organisations and internationally uh, and, uh, of course, Ramsey um, and Optimatra Assist, you know, uh, uh, as a former intelligence analyst, I knew the idea of going to Aceh, you know, sending Australian troops to Aceh prior to the tsunami is just like absolutely, you have to be, have rocks in your head to think it was even conceivable. And here we were sending troops to Af to Aceh. Um, so you need to be careful what happens. Um, and, and of course, in Timor in Opera Stute in 2006, we cobbled together a force. We didn't have a force, we didn't see it coming. We looked around, everyone's saying, What's going on in Dili? And all of a sudden, it's turned pear shaped. Why, why has that happened? Why, well, because we're, we're completely consumed. Uh, we're playing primary school soccer. Uh, anybody who's a thruster and wants to do anything is focused on Afghanistan and Iraq, of course. Um, now, there's some conceptual developments that's been going on in response <coughs> during this period. The Combat Training Centre is established, it gets live instrumentation system in 2006. SOCOM is established from the Director of Special Forces in late 2002 after the Olympics and 9-11. We see complex war fighting emerge. David Kilcullen masterfully um, uh, just manages to distill the essence of the Australian way of war, if you like, uh, in a way that when you read it as an Australian, you think, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, that's kind of, yeah, you know, that's right. But a foreigner uh, will look at it and think, wow, that's really good. You know? And it's, it's very interesting. David has masterfully done this because he distilled what we think is common sense uh, and, and articulated this idea of complex war fighting that uh, was about war being human and a social activity. And it was, you know, in certain respects, Klaus Fitzian and yet much more than that. Um, and it, as I say, it wasn't all that, it wasn't controversial in the Australian Army. You would have thought it probably should have been, but it wasn't. Um, and I think this is because it, it, it echoed and it resonated with the Australian operational military experience. There are other uh, responses to government enthusiasm and lessons from operations as well. We saw the mil uh, military operations in the literal environment emerge after Timor. Um, and this is a kind of the kernel, if you like, for what's happening with the creation of the LHD capability. Uh, we're recognising that this is a space we need to go into uh, and develop. Uh, the hardened and networked army is, is, is initiated in this period as well, with uh, focusing on precise networked and small and agile teams. We introduce main, main battle tanks, fresh new main battle tanks. And we also have the, 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 the early days of the army learning environment. It's created, the conceptual uh, work is done in Land Warfare Development Centre in 05. It's handed over to Training Command in 07. And the Centre, army, Centre of Army Lessons uh, is doing some integration of lessons as well. And, and we're, so, we're really seeing some progress being made. I mean, it's incremental. It's not perfect, but it's, it steps along the right way. We see some more conceptual developments in adaptive campaigning. Um, we see here in 2007 an articulation of, of, of the, the approach to campaigning that, uh, as General Gracious notes, there's nothing new here on one level. 
and yet it is an articulation in very simple, plain terms that is really useful for commanders, op tactical and operational commanders, to get their heads around and apply the principle in practice on the ground. Um, and, and there's five factors there adding to the complexity which really make this uh, adaptive campaigning resonate in the Army and in the ADF, I would argue, and that's these points about increasing lethality of weapons, the emptying of the battle space, uh, the, the difficulty in identifying uh, actors that aren't clearly discernible, the imp improvements to the ISTAR, intelligence surveillance target acquisition and reconnaissance capabilities, and this idea of operations among the people, or war amongst the people, the retreat of the adversary into complex urban terrain, making it so difficult to detect them from afar without getting your hands dirty. Another conceptual work uh, done in this period is the enhanced land force. We see the addition of 2,600 soldiers endorsed by the, the government following the op-tempo crunch of 2006, where we're deploying troops absolutely everywhere at the one time. Um, five and seven RAR split, eight, nine RAR re-raised, and what we're seeing is the, de the delivery to government of a concept-led, capability-based force, like General Hickling was advocating a few years before, but this is really a boutique force. This isn't the army of the Second World War. This isn't 14 divisions. This is three brigades and a special operations command. Um, we see future joint operational concept work being done with multi-dimensional manoeuvres. It's, it's got its detractors, but the idea of uh, knowing, reaching, acting and transitioning is conceptually helpful as we think about what we're doing uh, on operations around the world. Um, and it helps explain the ADF functions and intentions back to government as well. So that's a constructive thing. Um, but th there are some important questions that we need to ask ourselves. How much does this really help conceptualise further reform? And are we oversimplifying this? Uh, is it, and is that doing more harm than good? Um, we do see some work on core behaviours to reinforce learning disposition. And this is very constructive work, of course, very timely given uh, the scandals that we've seen in the last few years. Um, it, uh, we see that the Army is really responding appropriately to the government's and society's higher expectations. Um, and of course, the uh, web connectivity is generating all sorts of challenges with OPSEC, operational security, uh, and exposure of offensive behaviour. Um, we see the expansion of Headquarters Australian Theatre into Headquarters Joint Operations Command and its refinement, the absorption of some land command functions, uh, the formal links of DJFH Deployable Joint Force Headquarters uh, or Headquarters First Division into the Headquarters Joint Operations Command construct and the driving of the greater joint interagency multilateral and public focus for the Army. Adaptive Army comes along in response to the op-tempo and the circumstances. We see Land Command absorbed Training Command, becomes Forces Command, Army's training continuum is refined, the Foundation warfighting capability is stressed as part of this Adaptive Army mechanism, and the specialists are brigaded, uh, in particular 6th Brigade with the Command Support and Intelligence Surveillance Target Acquisition and Reconnaissance. <laughs> That's too many syllables. Um, let alone the, the acronym, jeez, it's just as long with the acronyms. Um, and 16 Aviation Brigade the, uh, and 17 Logistic Brigade. Um, but there's a critical vulnerability we see here. Um, there is a real lack of specialist redundancy with high op tempo um, and, and with the rotational force abilities of, of Beersheba that's not taken fully into account. We see the emergence in 2011 of the future secure, uh, special operations concept being prepared for fu a future with no peace or war, just constant competition. And this conceptualisation of SOCOM as the hedge force or the vanguard. Um, but I would caution against over-reliance on this. Uh, this is great for wars of choice, and we've been involved in a shed load of wars of choice in recent years. But in existential wars, reliance on SOCOM is a, a, a dangerous path, I would argue. So, we get to Plan B Sheba, we're seeing uh, a 36-month force regeneration cycle, three, three, three times 12 months, with readying 12 months, re uh, ready for 12 months, and then reset for 12 months, with one brigade, three brigade, and seven brigade being multi-role brigades, combat brigades. So, we've moved away from the construct of uh, uh, Hassett in 1970, uh, early 1970s, of, of specialised brigades. We've got multi-role brigades that give us some versatility uh, for force options. The key vulnerabilities remain the ones I touched on before, the one-shot capabilities in 6, 16 and 17 brigades. Critical vulnerabilities that really do need to be addressed um, because you can add another a couple of infantry battalions if you like, but the bottom line is these are not nice-to-haves and must-haves. 
Um, and I would, I would say that we need to really look at uh, focusing on phase zero, on regional operations, on re-engaging in our neighbourhood because our stocks are lower than they've been in a long time. The operational tempo, in terms of lessons and shortcomings, the tempo has been a key reform driver in the last <coughs> 15 years. The, a, a series of institutional mechanisms have, have emerged to maintain that despite the lower operational tempo that are vital, including Centre for Army Lessons, the Combat Training Centre and the concept of the Army Training Continuum. Um, the Mid Middle East area of operations uh, have been wars of choice and we've made niche contributions there which have admittedly helped hone the force. The ADF of today, the Army of today, is a much more uh, sharp-edged weapon than it was uh, prior to 1999. Um, and the special forces, as we know, they've been the government's force of choice for good reason. They've got a smaller footprint, they're lower casualty risk, and they've got high operational security. Um, so, you know, for a politically cautious government, it makes a lot of sense for a war of choice, an operation of choice, to send those who are least likely to cause you political angst. Um, but it's led, I would argue, to false lessons. Uh, we've sent gilded, edged, gilt edged national support uh, contingents with, with everything. Everything's Gucci. It's got everything, got reached back to every conceivable national technical means you can call on. Um, I would also argue that focusing on the Middle East area of operations has exposed us um, to vulnerabilities in our neighbourhood. We don't know the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or the Southwest Pacific like we used to. Who here speaks Bahasa, Tetan, Pidgin? My point is we have we have been on maintenance mode in our neighbourhood for 15 years, since 9-11. And the region has changed. And we barely have got our finger on the pulse. Because we've been too busy thrusting to get a Guernsey in the Mio. And the conceptual space has been taken up by that. And it's disconcerting. Um, so we have a, a deficit in regional language and cultural skills. Uh, we don't have that focus we used to have of learning Bahasa and Pidgin. Every battalion had a plethora of them in the old days, not so anymore. You've got plenty of Pashto and Arabic ones, but not so much of the region. Uh, we've got a lack of depth in regional relations. How many times has an exercise been called off because of the op tempo? How many times has a ship not deployed because it broke down and there was no replacement because of the Navy op tempo? How many times has an aircraft just not got there because of the op tempo? The DCP, the Defence Cooperation Program, it's been on maintenance mode, as I say, while it, Southeast Asia has been undergoing a revolution. We've undercooked our regional defence diplomacy. Now, critics will say, John, no, John, you got it wrong. We can walk and chew gum. Well, maybe, but only just. And at what cost to the grasp on regional security priorities? We need to have a long, hard look at the implications of thrusting to get a Guernsey in the sandpit on our ability to support any kind of pivot by anybody into our neighbourhood. So the game changer, I would argue, the LHDs, we need to think very carefully about constructively using this to, to engage our neighbours, bring them on board, and not just with infantry but with engineers, with, with medical, with logistics and other elements where we can build relationships. Sure, we might be able to build a bridge physically and metaphorically, but the relationships, I think, is the key and the trust is the key, where they can come on board and see that this is not a, about a threat to them, this is about us contributing to regional security and stability constructively. Um, so we, back to my chart, government expectation determinants, the closer to home, there's a lot of factors that kick in there. The further away, the more the options, the nicer to haves. Um, but we think, if, just briefly, on capabilities government expects, on operations of choice, they tend to be far away. Operations of necessity are closer to home. Uh, for, of choice, they're not necessarily against peer competitors. Our experience in the Middle East proves that. Um, closer to home, they may well be full spectrum all arms, with the whole of the ADF having to commit. Um, further away, niche contributions in our area, as I say, all arms. Gilt-edged national backups to, to operations of choice far away. Nearer to home, it's going to be harder to su sustain that. Far away, we're very worried about casualties. Closer to home, we think about East Timor in 99, the, the planning was, was predicated on anticipating up to 500 casualties and the Prime Minister was prepared to wear that. He would not be prepared to wear that in the MIO. So, operations of choice, sustainable with Plan B Sheba. Operations of necessity, I would argue, are not sustainable 
on, on Plan Besheba, particularly because of vulnerabilities in 6, 16 and 17 Brigade. So we need some redundancy, we need specialist redundancy. This is no longer a nice to have. This is actually critical for self-reliant, high tempo operations in our neighbourhood. Cultural understanding is vital. We've dropped the ball here. Who here speaks Bahasa? Who here speaks Pidgin and can do it fluently? Who here has been on an exercise in Southeast Asia or the South Pacific, Pacific for more than 24 hours in the last 10 years? Very few, I would argue. And that's where relationships are built. That's where stability is fostered. That's where we have a real ability to reach out and, and, and foster that, that stability we want to do. We need to bolster uh, command support uh, regiment and then integrating the national picture. This gets to the issue of cyber. Uh, cyber is something we haven't really grasped in any detail in the, in the Army, I don't believe, partly because cyber for defence is managed in, managed in the joint space and it's boffins do it. Well, I'm sorry, but that's no longer the case. We need to, uh, the Army needs to grab, uh, grab onto it, understand it, integrate it into its, its tactical and operational planning like never before. Um, I would argue we need a coalition IT uh, uh, network like we had in Interfet, the cobbled together one we had for Interfet, but we need a robust standing secret LAN facility that we can deploy so we can manage a coalition in our neighbourhood if we need to. Um, we need to grapple with heightened precision and lethality and a need to understand gr a greater, in a greater way um, how a regional war amongst the people will affect us in high or, uh, uh, or low intensity operations. Well, so what you, you may ask, why am I up here spruiking on about, about this? Uh, I think we need to be very careful about falling for half-baked ideas. I heard a senior official a few years back tell me, John, don't you worry, mission's accomplished. We've got us into NATO and the Dutch into a Rusgun. Really? Please. We've got to do better than that. Uh, we, we, we don't expect... We shouldn't expect, I should say, our political masters to think through the strategy for us. They look to us for advice. We should be offering robust, sound, thought-through advice with the long-term ramifications clearly in mind. Not just about what's going to happen to Army, but we need to think joint. We think, need to think national about the ramifications. Um, and the Army and the ADF must constructively engage its political masters with, with those strategic ramifications in mind. So if you want to read more, uh, uh, some of those ideas are in this book and the bloke there uh, circled hopefully will help us down the path to reform that will stand us in good stead for the future. Thank you, Chief.